This is the Fatty Joe Show, coming to you from Casa de Carrie, deep in the forests of Nutmegerville. This show is dedicated to exploring pathways to better health from a holistic perspective. In each episode, we will explore such topics as nutrition, mental and emotional health, fitness, and more. I'm Yogi, your host, and I became interested in studying health after conventional health dogma became damaging and led me to become massively overweight. Against modern convention, I went on a keto lifestyle and I lost over 300 pounds and gained a level of control on my personal health that I never had before. Now I'm on a journey to find out what is myth and what is truth in the ever convoluted world of what is considered healthy. Come join me on a journey of discovery as I look for a path to improve total health. If you'd like to support the show, head over to patreon.com slash the fatty Joe show or patreon.com slash Carrie Brown. If you want to check out all of our social media links and recipes, head to carriebrown.com. Don't forget to leave a comment, like, and subscribe to the show. That you've launched something. That's not easy. Thank you. I, I've had a lot of help from, from the, the guru that's downstairs. So, <laughs> so, um, all right, everybody, welcome to the Fatty Joe Show. Today, we have an awesome thing going on. First of all, we have a co-host today. Dana O'Leary is back on the show. Hi, Dana. Hi. And today, we also have the incredible journalist and head of the Nutrition Coalition and author, Nina Teichels, who is one of the people that's helping to revolutionize the way, hopefully, the U.S. starts looking at nutrition with a lot of the research and things that she's done and has been one of the lead gurus in the uh, keto world, helping people to change their lives for the better. Thank you for coming on the show, Nina. I, again, really appreciate having you on. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. So I always like to start off the show with getting everybody superhero origin stories. <laughs> I don't so, even know what that means. Like, who's my favorite superhero? Or no, you like, are the superhero. superhero like, we or... we, we want to know where where Nina Teichel's. Like, what got you? First of all, what got you into journalism, and then what got you to look at the nutrition side of things and and become uh -huh. this this leader in, in the world to make better changes for everybody with the Nutrition Coalition. Well, that's a nice thing to say. I, I, um, so I had a kind of circuitous, not direct path to getting where I am today, which um, should give hope to anybody who doesn't know what they want to do with their lives and only figures that out later in life. I mean, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I actually studied to become a doctor um, and took all my pre-med classes. I always loved science and my dad is an engineer and um, we were always talking about science at the dinner table. And, um, but I didn't want to go to medical school because I was terrified of not being able to sleep long enough. <laughs> <laughs> so wimpy now in retrospect because I have terrible insomnia and I'm like oh I sleep fine on four hours of sleep a night but I just thought I couldn't do it and it was also a time when there was a lot of questioning about medicine and and what doctors were really doing if and there was a lot of cynicism about it so then I was working in Washington DC and I found a group of people um, some of whom I knew from graduate school and others from college I just thought really the most interesting people that I like talking to are journalists um, because they are so, they have such curious questioning minds and they're always looking at things from 17 different angles and they're always having good arguments. Um, and then they also are people who like to talk on many different topics. And I always found their company really interesting. So I thought I would start, I would try to become a journalist. And I started at National Public Radio 
um, as an intern and sort of worked my way up there and ended up um, going to Latin America and doing reporting overseas for NPR. And also um, I did I worked in Washington for them. And then um, I didn't know what kind of journalist I wanted to be after that because I thought I, I love radio and I think it's a great medium. And of course, podcasting is kind of getting back to some of the great things about radio. You can be conversational. But I, I, I discovered that I have this intense obsessive compulsive disorder, <laughs> which is that I really like to do, I really like to research things in great depth. And in radio, I was always frustrated because you're just kind of skimming along the surface. You know, what can you say in a five minute piece or a nine minute piece? And so um, I did a bunch of journalism writing where I was writing pieces and I started writing some investigative pieces on the food industry for Gourmet Magazine, which back then, um, now it doesn't exist anymore, but it was an interesting magazine about food and also about the food industry. And um, I wrote the story on trans fats and that I was assigned. I had no idea what trans fats were, never heard of them. This is the early 2000s now. And um, I started talking to people about dietary fat. I started calling scientists about dietary fat. And that was this really eye-opening experience because I talked to scientists, I literally talked to scientists. Remember my dad's an engineer. And so we'd always had these calm, rational arguments. I thought everybody, this is the way science is, you know, calmly, cold, you know, just sort of dispassionately unfolds. I talked to scientists who hung up on me, were like, if you're going to talk about fat, that, you know, fat possibly being good, you know, I, I can't even talk to you. And they would hang up on me. And I talked to scientists who told me stories about having their papers yanked out of journals because somebody from the margarine industry had called up and didn't want their, their paper published. And then I talked to people who, you know, who, who told me about, um, being yelled at by at conferences and barely able to present their papers um, and people who would quit the field of studying trans fats because they had just sort of been harassed out of this um, this area of scientific inquiry. So first of all, I was just stunned. Like, how could there be so much? I felt like I was interviewing the mob sometimes. I, I, I said, like, am I actually studying science here? What am I studying? And um, so I came out with this story on trans fats that was kind of a, a groundbreaking story and recounted some of these anecdotes that I had experienced. And it also just opened up this huge world for me about dietary fats in general. And, you know, fat is since for the past, you know, 40, 50 years, really we have obsessed so much about fat. What kind of fat to eat? What is a good fat, bad fat? Um, low fat diet is what I grew up on. And so I got a book contract. I was kind of just handed a book contract to write about trans fats because this story in Gourmet had been so popular and had gotten so many writers and people writing in and readers. But then as I started going on that, doing this book about trans fats, I realized I really want to write a book about all dietary fat. And then, um, and then like <laughs> fast forward, not really very fast, but like almost 10 years later, nine years later, um, I realized, oh, I'm writing a book about saturated fats. Really my book was really, and this is my editor told me, she's like, you know, your book is really about saturated fat. And it was, it was a book about why we got it wrong on saturated fat. Like why, why do we believe that saturated fats are bad? How do we come to believe that? And then what replaced them? When we get rid of saturated fats, what do we put in the food supply? And that is polyunsaturated vegetable oils, margarine instead of butter, and what was wrong with them? So the, the whole book is really about that with a little chapter I couldn't bear to give up, which was on olive oil and the Mediterranean diet, um, which is a really fun chapter if you just want to have a quick read. But anyway, that's a long story that I've just given you. But it really was just this complete obsession. And if you go back into a subject and read all the science, you know, tens of thousands of papers, you just realize like it's just so fascinating to follow the paper trail of science on this issue. 
<sighs> okay. <Yeah>. So <laughs> I don't know if that's a superpower. It's like, it's just an obsession. And actually I see many people becoming obsessed the way that I have. I see like lots of bloggers and people on Twitter and they, they just, it is such an interesting rabbit hole to go down. Like, what do we know about diet? How do we get to thinking we, you know, what we think is healthy today? How do we, how do we even get here and, and what's wrong with it? So it's just kind of an endlessly fascinating topic. Yeah, I've, um, I, I've, I think one of the reasons why people are going down the rabbit hole so much, one reason is when people realize that a lot of the, the dietary dogma they've been taught their entire life has been a, basically not true, um, either through bad science or manipulated data, uh, that it, it really kind of gets them to question everything. And we are getting, we get so uh, tunnel vision, so much tunnel vision when it comes to dietary dogma, uh, no matter what area you go to, when your eyes finally open up and you start thinking like an engineer you're like what else might I be wrong about you know that at least that's how it was for me yeah I think it is in some ways a scary way to live because something that you have taken so deeply for granted like what is the what are the healthy things I put in my body I, I know that fruits and vegetables are healthy right yeah I just know that I've been taught that my whole life. And then to realize that maybe that's maybe that's not really the truth and that's not the way to get healthy. And then when these deeply held beliefs and they're not just beliefs, they're things that we do three times a day, right? So we're, we're so deeply involved in the food that we eat. When that goes out the window, you become this kind of person where you just don't trust anything and that is a disturbing way to live. Like I, everything I look at, every piece of advice I'm given, everything a doctor tells me, everything I, I, everything in the, in the, you know, on my shelf in the, in my bathroom, I think like, is this, it, should I trust this? You know, what is the so-called research behind it? And of course we can't all go reading every single piece of research behind everything that we consume or every pill we take or everything that we do, but you do become that kind of person where somebody says something to you and you're like, well, okay, <laughs> that could be true, but it could just as well not be true. <laughs> it's not a really comfortable way to live. I think we would all be a lot happier uh, really being able to trust our authorities. Um, but in such a basic way, they failed us. And I think what is even worse for me since I've written my book, which has been a few years now, is to realize that many, many of these people that I profiled in nutrition science, you know, I interviewed hundreds of doctors and PhDs for this academics. I know now, I know they know they're lying. Like I know, I can tell because I've seen them say things and then I've seen it, you know, kind of disappear. I know that they're getting, I've researched a lot about the money that they receive. I know that they know that they're participating in something that is not really true. And that is even harder for me to, um, to reckon with. Uh, you know, I've, I've had conversations with scientists who say, you know, well, we know that that's not true, but we really just have to figure out how to, angle out of it in a way that offers people, you know, a, like a gracious way out. That's really kind of what the nutrition expert world is trying to do is trying to kind of like sidestep the big errors and, and kind of move out into it, out of it in a gracious way, which I don't know what you think. I mean, I think there's kind of, well, there's nothing wrong exactly with that. People don't like to be cornered. People don't like to be you know, they don't like to say like, oh, I was 100% wrong. But there's another little part of me that thinks, sure, you want to you want to move out of this in the next 10, 15 years. But you know, what about the person who's diabetic right now? Yeah. What about the person who's facing getting their foot cut off? I mean, I just feel like there's a part of me that thinks like, there is there is there is no I have no patience for people who you know, who want to save their careers. There, there are people who are suffering who are 
hundreds of pounds overweight. I mean, there's so much suffering going on that is just not acceptable. Um, so so I, feel very, I feel like less sympathetic <laughs> about that. I think, you know, it's interesting to me because when I was in fellowship, you're required to do publications and stuff. And I was in academic medicine for a few years and it's the whole publisher pairs thing. And I found out so fast how impossible it is to get published if you don't have a specific name on your paper, right? Really, these journals, it's all about yeah, the impact factor, but it's it's about who's doing it, even if the study's complete crap. And that's one of the reasons I got out of academic medicine, because I was like, this is, I mean, all of these things that are getting published in reputable journals are just terrible studies. And then other things, and not necessarily nutrition, but I think at the time I got out of academic medicine personally, just because I just couldn't handle it anymore. And you know, I wanted to kind of make my own decisions, but then I read your book and I've read your book probably five or six times because it's fantastic. Wow. And honestly, I'm a little starstruck right now, but I don't know what I'm with you, but um, it's just, oh my goodness, it was so eye opening because it was, it's true. It makes you question everything because I thought it was just my specialty or, you know, and kind of my little niche and like part of the scientific world, but it's not. It's, it's everywhere, but I just don't know. There's so, there's so many egos, so many egos. Um, and you're right, they know they're wrong, but it doesn't mean wow. they're going to change anything. I don't know how to get well, past that. They do. I mean, so this is kind of the crux of, so, so on a happy note, the happy note, the good note in all this is it's like, the, yes, there's a lot of things that are wrong with science, probably in every field. I mean, the field, yeah. you, you know, the little, the little leaf you looked under and the little leaf that I looked right. under and like, <laughs> wow, what did we see? So there must, we know that every, like, there's a lot of leaves you can look under and find the same mess. Right. But one positive thing is that in, unlike say in environmental science where, you know, you and I cannot test whether or not, you know, how much cars are leading to air pollution. Like we don't have the capacity to do that, but we do in nutrition, everybody can test their own N equals one experiment on their own body. Like mm -hmm. everybody has a capacity to do their own science in nutrition. Right. And that is super liberating. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't, we don't know what's causing global warming and I have no ability to contribute to that debate. But um, I can experiment on my body. Like, how does vegetable oils affect it? How does this kind of carb or that kind of carb? I can put a glucose monitor on. So we do have a lot of power over what we can do ourselves. But the reason that I got involved, I founded this group called the Nutrition Coalition and decided to do, try to do the crazy thing, which I didn't realize how crazy it is, of trying to change our national policy. Okay, so just so everybody understands, our national policy is the US Dietary Guidelines for Americans. And although you think you haven't heard of them maybe and you don't know what they are, or maybe you remember the food pyramid or maybe you know my plate or, they are so powerful and they affect everybody. So in ways that impinge upon all our, our lives, right? So they, they're the people that, they are the reason that when you go to your doctor, your doctor says, oh, you're on a crazy fad diet. And I'm, and, and, and they, you know, they're not allowed to, the gold, the dietary guidance are considered the gold standard and doctors are not allowed to, in many large medical practices, that is all they're allowed to prescribe. Yeah. But beyond that, like that's, what's taught in medical education. Mm -hmm. I'll just tell you a quick story of this uh, medical student I spoke to who who was getting like their one day of training, as you know, as a doctor, they only get you like one day of training in nutrition and goes up to their professor afterwards and says, you know, hey doctor, I, you know, I heard you talk about the guidelines, but I, do you know anything about keto and low carb and have you heard of that? And the, the, the doctor on stage says to him, well, you know, I myself am keto, <laughs> but I'm not allowed to teach that to you. Um, that's forbidden. And that's because of the guidelines. So. 
you know, and it's taught through all K through 12 education. There's like a heartbreaking article just today in the New York Times about how kids are learning at very young ages, learning how to calorie count, getting obsessed about their bodies, shamed about their weight, you know, like basically like developing eating disorders from, from practically birth, all of that, all of that education comes from the guidelines. Yep. So I could go on and on school lunches, you know, feeding programs for the elderly, blah, blah, and all those, a lot of those people, if you're a poor person in America, if you are on an Indian reservation or in a, in a nursing home or you're a kid who's at school getting breakfast and, you know, lunch and maybe breakfast at school, you are the women and infant children program, you're a woman with a young baby, you don't have any choice about what you eat. You can't even do that experiment on your body. And I will tell you what they feed those people. The dietary guidelines requires 50 to 55% of your calories is carbohydrates. And half of those have to be refined grains mm. because only those grains are enriched and fortified. And that's the only way they can get people enough iron and folate and, and zinc. And that's because they don't allow any animal foods Women on the WIC program get no meat. There's no meat at all. And their dairy is usually like, there's a lot of sweetened dairy and they get like, I was just looking up what's on the WIC program. Kellogg, Kellogg's frosted blueberry mini wheats. That's what they get to set up their children for life. So it's like, and they have no choice. So that's why I just feel like it's so important to change these guidelines. Also the military, we have a huge obesity problem in the military. The military is, is following the guidelines. So, I mean, this is like, I could go on and on and be super boring. I will stop. But I think like it is really important to change these guidelines so that, um, so that people can have more choices. They can go to the doctor and get the right advice. They go to medical school, they get the right advice. They're a poor person, they can get food that will actually nourish them. They, um, I mean, it's so many cases where people don't have choice. So that's why I just felt it was so important to like just try to get some science into these guidelines. But, mm. you know, what people, <laughs> what we're up against, what people like us are up against is, you know, you're up against the food, just the behemoth food industry, which has been running these guidelines forever. You're up against the pharmaceutical industry, which, you know, just to be blunt, really does, you know, they're, they don't want people getting healthier. They prefer right. to have everybody taking insulin and on, you know, on four or five pills a day, which is what the average American takes. And, um, and you're up against, I mean, you know, I could really you know, go on. I mean, you're up against the status quo, the people who don't want to change their mind, the university professors or the ones we were talking about, the cognitive dissonance, don't want to, don't want to say they're wrong. And you're up against a huge animal rights activist movement, which don't, they really don't want people eating any animal foods at all. So there's, and these forces have all been at work in Washington for decades. So... Yeah you know, for, for like, I mean, this was the first go around of the guidelines. They're updated every five years and they're going to come out by the end of this year, the new iteration of them. And this was like the first time anyone in Washington had like the debate even included the words low carb. Wow. <laughs> Nobody had even inserted that into the debate. I, I know from our conversation uh, that I had with Dana when she was on our interview that she's worked with low income people. I used to work at group homes for at risk kids, domestic violence, sexual assault shelters, and I didn't have the nutrition background knowledge that I have now. And I wish I did, because what I am now looking back and realizing what I was witnessing, we had kids who were on insulin for type one or type two diabetes, oftentimes the medications that they were already taking were leading toward diabetic type symptoms and things like that. And a lot of our kids became overweight and obese and their solution for uh, in the group home was to cut meat out, give them things like green bean casserole with canned cream of mushroom soup and as much carbohydrates as they wanted, as long as they came from a plant and then just cover it with insulin. Yeah, I mean, 
this is a it's a real tragedy and i and the tragedy you know why i'm so obsessed with these guidelines it's like people think they're doing the right thing they think that what they're doing is healthy most doctors think that what the advice they're giving out is the correct and good and right advice and and so we can't blame them we can't blame the people although we although people routinely do but you know you can't blame the people who themselves are getting overweight and 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 contracting diabetes because they're just everybody's just following the expert advice and the experts are delivering this advice that is that is i mean is literally killing people i mean so it's really tragic. I mean, I, I feel so sad about our our country. I mean, especially when you know, I, you know, especially when you can reverse diabetes in the largest and longest experiment on diabetes that was that's been undertaken um, that's uh, being conducted in Indiana. They were able to reverse diabetes in half their population of a few hundred people, people that had been di had diabetes for an average of eight years, they were able to reverse that diagnosis within 10 weeks. Within wow. 10 weeks, That's you can, cool. you can, and within 10 weeks, you can bring down somebody's blood pressure to the point where they no longer need blood pressure medication. I mean, we could do so much so quickly, um, but we're, we're just setting people up. I mean, but it's not, I should say, it's not possible necessarily to restore somebody's metabolism to the point where they will actually, you know, once you've wrecked your metabolism and you've gained a lot of weight and you've dealt with diabetes, it is very hard to recover from that fully. Many people just don't, or, or it takes them many, many years. Um, but you know, for instance, the American Diabetes Association, which knows that the CEO of the American Diabetes Association went on a talk show and said, I got off all my medications because I wore a blood glucose monitor and she explained. And she said, you know, if you, if you just keep your blood, your sugar, blood sugar low, you can, then you don't need insulin. And then she was kind of, but her board is full of insulin makers. And so she was then marched out a couple of days later and had to do a big mea culpa, like, you know, carbs are okay. It's okay to eat carbs. Even though she herself had recovered from diabetes by, by doing this. Anyway, it's, it's really, really sad. I think, you know, the solutions are right in front of us and nobody wants to look at them. I mean, I could tell you so many stories like that. People know the solution is there, but they can't talk about it because, you know, on TV, they can't talk about it because they get a lot of, and also, in a, you know, but mainly in tele, television is full of, of advertisements about for, for pharmaceutical companies. No, and, no, is that, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I'll just say one more story, which is, okay. There was a, an op-ed um, by somebody who had participated in this the experiment that I just told you about, the one in Indiana on, on diabetes. And there was an op-ed by somebody who had worked on that experiment and, and Fox.com, which is kind of associated with Fox News Channel, they accepted the opinion piece about, you know, reversing diabetes with a low carb diet. And, and then the on-air personality on Fox said, you have to, we can't run this op-ed because I've been telling people on air for years and years and years that they they need to eat carbohydrates, hmm. and so um, and so they they turned around and rejected the op-ed after accepting it, which is highly unusual. Just I mean I've almost never I've I've done dozens of op-eds I've never seen that happen. Well, anyway, crazy. How do you? I mean, how do you get past that? Because you, you have so many people not willing to admit that they were wrong. You have so many people who either do not want to look at the data and decide for themselves or don't have time because it's a, a lot of data. But yeah. then you also have so much, social media has so much power. I mean, anytime I Google, I, I don't know, the other day I was looking up 
trying to look up their lipid profile in a piece of red meat, right? And I got the answer I wanted, but the, everything on my Facebook account and any ad that shows up since then has been a vegan or vegetarian ad. It's like anytime I look up anything to do with health or food, I get flooded with vegetarian stuff, yeah. vegan stuff. And I, I don't want to see it. It doesn't have anything even to do with what I was looking at other than being food, but it's, yeah, it's almost like somebody is. Yeah. There's another untold story about, you know, Facebook, Twitter. I don't know if Twitter, I know Facebook, I mean, Zuckerberg, is you know heavily invested in fake meats uh right. youtube has been censoring videos on keto pulling yanking off videos on popular keto videos instagram owned by facebook is doing the same they're all invested in fake meat so one of the things that which is just so disturbing i've heard mm -hmm. i it's something that i want to write about um I suspect Twitter is doing the same. I mean, I but but people have really been experiencing pretty serious outright censorship or shadow banning of their material, anything that involves meat. Um, and and in many cases, uh, it's because there are investments. So it's complicated. They have they're invested in these. Uh, these meat alternative companies, which are seen as huge growth opportunities. And so they have an investment in them. So they have a financial interest, but is it the financial interest or is it their genuinely felt belief that eating meat is going to destroy right. the planet? So they've, they've made these investments, but somebody who's as rich as Zuckerberg is, is, you know, he's probably thinking I'm doing the right thing by keeping people away from meat because right. we need to save the planet. So that's a whole other set of, I believe, a kind of, a kind of, blown out of proportion kind of mythology that has been exacerbated by, um, you know, a lot of their, their huge business interests lined up to try to push people to be vegan in order to open up all these markets for food. And, and I'm talking that like the World Economic Forum at Davos has gotten behind this idea. And there are all these companies that will benefit if people <clears throat> remove meat from, if they stop eating meat and only eat these all, it's, it's a huge expanding market for all these companies. Um, so, so it's not that there's no greenhouse gas effect of meat, but is it, is it as dangerous and bad? And does it require the level of his, uh, kind of attention around it that we're currently getting? I think that is more sort of about the the PR efforts that are behind this and the fact that these very powerful platforms have um, control over what they're showing. I mean, I used to, or Google as well, Google's another one, very invested in the get, getting rid of meat um, in order to save the planet. I mean, if you search, it used mm -hmm. to be, it's not, I think it's no longer true, but it used to be that if you searched healthy diet, the first thing that came up was was the PETA diet, which is the, you know, the animal, animal activist vegan diet. The, and that was on Google. So, so, I mean, I think it's, um, I think it's, it's, well, I would, what I was going to say actually was one thing people can do is there is the power of the people. And I think this is an area where grassroots has to make the difference. It just has to. I will give you a little story to give you some hope. When something called the Eat Lancet diet was launched, which was like yeah. a near vegan mm -hmm. diet that was, um, you know, which was which is like 88% carbohydrates and the amount of meat you, red meat you're allowed to eat daily was like the size of my thumb. And um, when that diet was launched, this, and they had, they launched, they had like, I might, it was either 40 or 60 countries that they had separate rollouts in, like huge events. They had millions and millions of dollars behind this. When they launched, they, they were pretty much stopped in their tracks by the unbelievable social media outpouring that resulted that I think was spontaneous. I mean, I don't know anybody who organized it, but there was a hashtag that started called yes to meet number two meet. 
and um, I wrote a, a you know a blog piece about it. I mean, a number so there were four or five of us who wrote about the fact that this diet was nutritionally insufficient. It didn't meet our nutritional needs. It was it was too high in carbohydrates to be safe for most people with metabolic you know if you have a metabolic disease. People wrote about the financial interests behind them and the companies that were supporting this. Um, people wrote about the lack of evidence that there was, you know, there really have been no clinical trials on this diet or any other vegan diet. I mean, there have been clinical trials, but they show no benefit. So, so, and, and, and we, the people really, I mean, people just went crazy. And so, uh, later there was a paper published by the Eat Lancet people saying, how, why did we fail? Like they considered their rollout to be a failure. It doesn't mean they're going to stop trying, but I'm just saying they, they considered that rollout to be a failure. And, and they specifically cited like my article, the one by, you know, Diana Rogers, who's, who's, uh, you know, who's a dietitian, who's also just come out with a film on meat. And they, they cited the yes to meat hashtag. And they said, this is what defeated us. And you know, I just see it happening again and again to the point, like the, every time the American Heart Association puts out one of its little like blog posts about here's a healthy breakfast of pancakes and blueberries and orange juice, you know, it's just, people just kill it. <laughs> you, <laughs> I mean, you know, you get like 50 angry posts after that. And I think, um, so I really think that, 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 that really, I know this sounds corny, but because we're in a time, we're in an election period, I feel I can use language like this. We the people are going to be the most powerful force against this. Yeah, well, we, we know that a lot of dietary changes uh, come from the bottom up. It's when customers go out to buy something, and then companies go, we can make money off of this. And there they go. But you've, you have become in many ways with the Nutrition Coalition and the books you've written and the journalistic articles you put out, kind of a boogeyman with some of these uh, larger food companies and organizations. They have actually worked to try to discredit your, your work coming, posting ad hominem articles on the New York Times. And uh, there was a vegan website that, that really kind of seems to be very scared of you. And I've read some of these articles and they, they say how wrong you are with your research, but they don't give you any evidence on their side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's, um, I, I, I I, I mean, of course I'm a boogeyman to them. I mean, I, I mean, of course I'm a threat. Any and, and, and any of us who have any prominence and who have any access to mainstream media or have a significant following, any of us are are a threat um, to their narrative. And so they take that seriously. But you know, I have been out now talking about these issues and for um well, for about six years now, and I will tell you that I've had, um, I've had, I've sat down with top scientists and had private conversations. I've had public debates with people on radio. I've had, you know, I, I've had every possible way to debate the arguments, and I have yet. I'm not trying to be arrogant, but I'm just saying that I have yet to hear an argument that makes me think. Well, I really got that wrong. Um, I, I mean, I think that, like, I think, you know, on saturated fats, clearly they're not harmful. Uh, clearly meat does not give you diabetes um, or cause heart disease. The evidence on that is extremely weak. And, and the, you know, the papers published on that only get stronger. Um, the literature just continues to grow and grow about the the benefits of of restricting and reducing carbohydrates. Although I would say it's still an open field, and we don't know exactly, you know, how and what for how many, you know, which people and exactly what kind of formulation. I think there's a lot of variation. There's a lot of exciting studies that still need to be done. Clearly, vegetable oils are bad for you. Um, I think that has, I mean, there's just, I, I don't hear any arguments on the other side. I think, you know, one of the things that I did over the nine years that I was 
really struggling with my book was, and by the way, I was also like raising kids and I wasn't only doing this for nine years, but I mean, pretty periodically with some frequency, I would lay down on the floor in the living room in front of my husband and say, I can't do this. There's no way I can do this. I must be wrong. I have to be wrong. And, you know, so you go over and you recheck and you recheck and you recheck yourself and because you really don't want to come out and have egg on your face when you, you know, and I did get little things wrong in my book. I mean, I had corrections. If anybody has a hardcover book, there's, you know, there's definitely corrections to that book. I did get small things wrong, but I don't think I got any big things wrong. Um, and so ad hominem attacks is sort of the only kind of attack left right? She only does it because she wants to make money. She's, uh, she's not a scientist. She doesn't have degrees after her name. She's, I mean, it's just, it's, I mean, those are, or the whisper campaign that somehow I'm paid by the meat industry, which is completely untrue. I mean, those are the only kinds of attacks that really remain. Mm -hmm. And you just have to develop a really thick skin, um, which I guess I've done. <laughs> I mean, I am not that way naturally, but I, I mean, you just have to, if you want to remain a voice in the world, you have to. It would also be nice to have a huge war chest of money to do things like combat the way that they distort my Google rankings. And, you know, there's, there's so much money there, the money that can be thrown into destroying your reputation online. And you have to have, I don't know, you really have to have hundreds of thousands of dollars to fight that, which I just don't have. So I, I can't. I can't fight that. Well, it really does seem like the the money talks in this industry, and that's that's that seems to be the drive. It isn't people's health. It's it's the driving force is profit be behind the nutritional guidelines and what's going on. And I think in, in many ways that the that that money aspect is going to be what's needed to fight the nutritional aspect of. Um, really proving to the the people how much money that they can save in their own personal gdp by eating healthy because you're not going to have mm -hmm. to go spend as much money on on medical uh treatment uh, you know you're going to save money by by not having to take so many drugs and not having you you're, you're going to be more productive because your mind functions better they, they've proven that um, giving people a better, higher protein diet in prisons improves self-control. I saw that, That's, yeah. You know, so the behavioral issues, that means if, if more people are in self-control, there may be less crime. Right. Imagine. It, or here's a thought for you. The fact that, you know, police officers are so overweight, yeah. um, wouldn't that make them, I mean, think of all the cops and robbers shows that you saw when, you know, when we were young, like they would chase the criminal, they would run, mm -hmm. they were in good shape. But if you're in really bad shape, you're not chasing anybody. So you're probably much more likely just to shoot that person. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But, I'll, you know, what, what if our law, enfor our law enforcement is, it has huge problems with disabilities and, and obesity, but you well, know, sorry, go let's ahead. Look at what, uh, I was going to say, let's look back to our military. It, our military is one of the reasons why our dietary guidelines changed with the, the paid for studies with Ansel Keys and things like that, trying to get people to be uh, the right weight to gain weight in order to go into the military. And now it's reversed the, you know, to the other side. And we have the military now investigating ketogenic diets for the Navy SEALs and things like that for, for getting back to regular body weight, as well as um, the capacity to perform for longer periods of time. So, you know, the military may be one of our allies as far as bringing things over. And, and we know the police force often follow what the military does. Right. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you a good story, which is that um, I met with the man who is the head of all of nutrition for the entire military. And we had like an hour long lunch. At the beginning, it was like his, it was almost like he had never heard of 
low carb or he was being very closed. You know, he was very guarded. And by the end of lunch, he was telling me, he's like, you know that entire units have gone keto. He says, and you know, the whole special forces has gone keto and, um, or big, big portions of them have gone keto. And, and then the, the rest of the military re really looks to the special forces and follows them. So they may be changing even without, you know, without any orders from, from above, you know, I think they're just changing because they see the, the, they see the benefit and, um, you're right. I mean, people say, I, I was just talking to somebody who um, is not wealthy and she said, oh, you know, I got off paleo because it was, it was so expensive and they insisted that I, you know, they insisted I have like everything be grass fed meat and really high quality everything. And, um, you know, about keto being un affordable it's, it's like, first of all, I would always say that, you know, it's, it's better to have regular meat or regular or eggs, eggs are cheap, ground beef is cheap, and it's bigger, better to get it, uh, you know, if you can't afford the, the special fancy kind, it's still better to eat that than, than a box full of macaroni. Um, and you do, as you said, like you end up saving if you're not on taking medicines, if you're not, if you're not, um, you're not taking insulin, you save a lot um, when it comes to your not having to go to the doctor, not having, um, just not having all those expenses. You do have to buy a new wardrobe, however, which is. <laughs> I just recently had to do that. I, I, mm -hmm. At one point in my life, I, I was wearing size 68 pants and 10 XL shirts. Wow. Um, wow, you I'm, look amazing. I, I, well, I'm also six foot six and I, I'm built, you know, powerlifting and things like that. I'm built in a certain way, although I have lost a lot of muscle mass compared to what I used to be but I'm built in a certain way. So I carried it in a way that people were very shocked to find out I was 618 pounds. And, um, but recently we went out and I had to invest in size 38 pants. Wow. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Uh, I have but a friend. I was, Sorry. Go I ahead. Was, like I said earlier, I was a 600 pound vegetarian. Yeah. I, I was eating the standard American diet and, and thought I was eating healthy. And yeah. I, yeah. And you no, know, I, I was vegetarian. I think, I don't know if I told you, but I used to like cook every week. I used to make my own bread. I was like, I thought I was being so healthy and um, yeah. And I, and, and I was, well, I was not, I didn't have as much weight to lose, but I, I was about 20 pounds heavier than I am now. And, you know, it's really sad. I just think it's it's really the hardest thing. Well, there's so much that's hard, but it's really hard to think about how much of life, how better life could have been if you had just been given this information at, this, at the beginning, right? You know, I was one of those people who was going to nutritionists from the time I was a teenager and, you know, I just think if one of those people had known about keto or low carb, but wow, that would have really been a big difference for me. And, 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 you know, from, and, and I, what, I didn't gain hundreds of pounds. So, I mean, I just think like what the, the, just the feeling of like how much life is wasted for people not getting good information yeah. is sad. It makes you angry too, really. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was a kid who grew up on the WIC diet, and you know, my mom would make us eat healthy, and all of you know, healthy was exactly like you said, making your own bread and trying to avoid certain things, but you know, still everything was still cooked with margarine because that was supposed to be healthier <laughs> than butter and all of those things, and you just so many lives have been so wrecked because of these guidelines that I think, you know, what you said at the beginning is so true that it just something needs to happen, but I don't know. 
don't know what that something can be. It seems hopeless at times, really. Well, um, getting back to that grassroots idea, can I just give your listeners one thing to do? You can give our listeners whatever you want to give them. This okay. is your show, lady. <laughs> I mean, I, I just have one suggestion to make, which is, um, which is to um, go to nutritioncoalition.us and um, hit the take action button, which might be hidden in the menu. I, it shouldn't be, but it is at the moment. Anyway, it's a red take action button and it will, it takes you to a page that will then contact um, your congressman um, or, or the congressman who we think are the most important on this issue. But what it says at this point I just want to tell you the crazy shenanigans that have gone on with these guidelines. Again, issued every five years, they're supposed to update the science. Let me just give you the highlights of the things that went wrong. Number one, they were supposed to review a low carb diet for the first time ever in history. What happened? They couldn't find any studies except for one on the low carb diet. They were like, we just couldn't find them. Let me, let me tell you, there are like a hundred clinical trials now on low carb diets. But they could, they, the only one that they found was authored by a member of the, what's called the Dietary Guideline Advisory Committee. It's a small, supposedly expert appointed group. Otherwise, they couldn't find any of them. I, I, I actually have been in correspondence with the Assistant Secretary of Health who wrote me a letter saying everything you say is wrong, Nina, um, which I was kind of flattered but that he actually bothered to do that. And... Um, <laughs> And I wrote back to him and he's like, we couldn't find any low carb studies. So, and I, and I wrote back to him, my analogy was, you know, that is like, you're putting together a zoo and your selection criteria for your giraffes is like, we need giraffes with no neck. And you end up with a zoo that has no giraffes in it. Well, you, you know, if you're a reasonable person, you understand there's something wrong with your selection criteria if you don't get any giraffes in your zoo. And that's pretty much what happened with the low carb studies. They had these selection criteria that were like, we won't get any low carb studies if we use this, this criteria. So they couldn't find any studies in the low carb diet. They decided, this expert committee, that they were not going to look at any studies on weight loss or obesity. Why? Because oh, no reason, <laughs> you know, 42.4% of American adults have obesity now, not overweight, obese. Mm. And that is higher for, you know, if you're African-American or if you're, if you're you know, black or brown people, all, that, all of those numbers are higher. It's almost so sure, at 50% now confusing. for African-American women. They looked at zero studies on weight loss. So... Um, they also didn't look at any of the science that has happened in the last 10 years on saturated fats, which as you know, is a subject I like to obsess about, but you know, the last 10 years has seen like 20 review papers saying we got it wrong on saturated fats. They didn't look at any of those. So those are just some of the things that they did. So then, but the original sin of the guidelines is that they're designed by they, they were created only to be for prevention, to keep people healthy. That was their idea. They, they weren't going to venture into treatment because treatment is for specialty doctors. So they were only going to be for prevention. Well, when they started in 1980, most Americans were healthy. Now, most Americans are unhealthy. So getting back to this page on the Nutrition Coalition site, what we're asking the, the Congress to do is to require that the guidelines come with a, be very clear about what they're for. They're only for healthy Americans. So they cannot be applied. They cannot refer, they cannot have anything to do with people who are diagnosed with a diet related chronic disease, which is 60% of the country at least. So we wanted, we would be basically want to like restrict the overreach of these guidelines. They, they, can, they, they have to stop saying that they're for all Americans because they're not. And this is what we feel like. We can't go back and fix the science at this point. It's too late. We tried throughout the whole process. We said, hey, here's some low carb studies to look at and here's the science on saturated fat, but they totally ignored everything that we did. So at this point in the process, we're just saying, can we restrict your influence? 
because you say you're only for prevention. So make that clear to the public. Okay. So that's what I would like every single one of you to do. Every one, one of you listeners, use your voice, make yourself heard. If this happens, then at least when you, as somebody with type two diabetes or with overweight obesity, or you can sit and your doctor tries to give you the, you know, the vegetarian USDA diet, you can say, you know what, that's not for me. That's inappropriate for me. I have carbohydrate intolerance and those are 50 to 55% carbohydrates. And that's, and so you, so that needs to be clear. So anyway, we're hoping people will participate. That's good. Yeah, I also want to encourage people to uh, sign up for your newsletter because your newsletter is a fantastic resource to stay up to date on all kinds of aspects of the nutritional world and what's going on in, in the political nutritional world, as well as the research that that's coming up. I think your newsletter is fantastic for that. Thank you. The, that's also on our Nutrition Coalition website. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, thank you. I, I, we try hard, although we don't get it out really every month, but we do try, try to do that. Well, I, I mean, I have to say I, I do appreciate it because like I, when I, I started doing this, it was originally not for weight loss. It was for brain health. And I, I went into research as many avenues as possible before I, I did this because I have been burned by diets before. And so yeah. I really did that. And you keep bringing up saturated fat and there's something I'd love for you to talk about if you can, if you're willing, but let's look at what's going on today in the mental health aspect of the world. Since we have been on a low saturated fat diet, we have had a massive uptake in mental health conditions around the U.S., and we are finding that a lot of mental health uh, issues are being resolved more effectively by incorporating higher amounts of good quality saturated fats in the diet. And I'm not talking, I'm not saying this is a panacea for all mental health issues, but I am saying that there have been studies done on autistic people incorporating saturated fat and having less sensory issues that cause them to, you know, you know, be more severely affected by their condition. They've been testing people who are schizophrenic. They've been testing people who are depressed and it seems to really help with depressive disorders and self-control order this issues. So what do you think this world would look like, the U.S. would look like if more saturated fats, healthy versions of saturated fats were brought into the diet when it comes to a mental health standpoint for our country? Um, it's a really good question. And I think that um, uh, it's a little hard to disentangle what the impact is on mental health. When people go on a low carb or ketogenic diet, they tend to do two major things. They reduce starches and sugars, and it's part of a healthy ketogenic diet. Um, you know, the vast majority of time, people learn to switch out of uh, vegetable oils to healthier fats. Right? They learn not to fear butter, coconut oil, even lard. And so those two things happen, and we don't know which one is contributing to the improvements that people see. And, and there are very few clinical trials at this point. It's still mainly anecdotal that people that, you know, as a doctor in Harvard who has re you know, reversed somebody's schizophrenia, severe schizophrenia that they've had their whole life. Um, we know anecdotally that, that many, many people report getting off their antidepressants and other medications. We know, I mean, there's just hundreds of cases and there's surveys that we have that is that it's not the same as a clinical trial. But I will share with you like a piece of data I think most people don't know or don't think of this way um, that is in my book, but is um, in the original clinical trials on saturated fats back in the 1960s and 70s, 
they they switched saturated fats with polyunsaturated vegetable oils. So this was a clinical trial, most rigorous kind of science you can do. In one group, they had about um, 18% of, wait, let me get this wrong. Uh, yeah, about 18% of calories of saturated fats. And in the other group, they had, um, they, they brought that down to 9% and they replaced it with vegetable oils, okay? But they did not reduce sugars and starches. So they were able, we, these are experiments that just isolated the effect of saturated versus unsaturated fats. And one of the absolute consistent findings of these studies that was very surprising was that the group having the vegetable oils uh, ha consistently had higher rates of death from suicide or accidents. This is kind of a lumped together category that we that was not disentangled so we don't really know um but you know suicides is significant there were always more suicides in that group and accidents you know who knows what, what you know why do people have accidents maybe they maybe they get in a fight or something or or no i'm sorry there was a third part of that category which was violent deaths um and why do you know why would somebody get involved in a violent interaction in unless they're in you know fighting in, in some way so that the, that's and these were large some were very long-term clinical experiments that like followed people all the way to death so it was like they they were very big i'm talking about experiments on tens of thousands of people huge amount of data here that tells me that there's something about either the saturated fats themselves that is protective for the brain or uh, the fact that people who, what happens when you go on a vegetable oil diet is that your cholesterol levels become depleted. We always think cholesterol, you know, so we've been taught that high cholesterol is bad, but in fact, your body needs cholesterol in every cell in its body. And one of the places it needs cholesterol is the brain. And what happens when you deplete cholesterol in the brain? Um, well, it could be that that is what is happening in these experiments, but I think that's a lot of rigorous data telling us that switching over from saturated to unsaturated fats is not good for mental health. Dana, did you have anything to want to put in? Um, no, I just think it's, uh, it's very interesting. That's all you, know, you see. I agree, you see so much mental health these days and everybody's trying to fix it by medications and <laughs> that can be toxic and you're not well, having you know, much luck. If anything, they're getting worse. Sorry, you know. So. Yeah, no, 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 you're right. I mean, we, and then we have lifelong dependencies on these medications, right? Mm -hmm. I was gonna add that there's also some interesting case studies on people with Alzheimer's showing that if they add in specifically, like people believe in these 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 middle chain uh, saturated yeah. MCTs they're called, they can they seem to start reversing the symptoms of, of um, Alzheimer's. I mean, I think what we're gonna find more and more is that you, there's just much, there's a lot you can do with food. Um, yeah. And you know, people want to get off their medications. Um, yeah but you need to support them with good food to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. it's, it's, you know, I, I often preach that the least, we should be looking at medicine in, in the fullest part, going from the least invasive procedures to yeah. then graduating up. And the least invasive mis procedures are sometimes the toughest, but it's lifestyle. And a lot of our lifestyle aspects and mainly what we put into our body, what we eat, how we sleep and how we deal with stress are all these things that are negatively affecting our, our health outcomes and requiring us to seek more medical care and going. And we often, because we want the easy way out, we often jump to give me the pill or give me the surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm overweight. So give me that lap band surgery and we're seeing that that lap band surgery is, is effective in the short term, but often doesn't give people the long-term 
uh, results like going on to a healthier whole real foods diet with uh, proper amounts of nutrition? You mean the answer is super obvious, I think. Um, it is. It really it's painfully is. Painfully obvious. I mean, people who get bariatric surgery, all those surgeries, they they relapse. They have some of their some of them have terrible digestive problems. We have the other stomachs cut out, their colons cut out. I mean, they really suffer down the line. They're expensive. Um, I mean, it's just so clear that the solution is eating better food. Um, not that that's easy. I think, you know, I think like getting out of food addiction is, is also a real issue coming, you know, coming out of food addiction, changing your palate so that you no longer crave sweet food so much, um, getting not stress eating. I'll tell you, it's really interesting. This long-term study that I referred to now twice in Indiana on helping people reverse their diabetes and they, um, you know, they've done, they've, they, they have five-year data now, but I was talking to the head of that study and I, and, you know, they haven't, they haven't, the numbers are stayed like between 50 and 60% of people were able to reverse their diagnosis of diabetes. But I, I said, you know, well, why, why do people go off this? I mean, they're feeling so much better. They look so much better. They've lost weight. And she said, number one reason is stress, some stress event in people's lives, like they, somebody dies, there's a loss of a job. I mean, and so you think about the times we're living in right now, like mm -hmm. massive stress. And, and many people who, you know, are used to stress eating and those are their comforting foods. And, you know, I have to say, like, for me, it is still, you know, if you give me a piece of apple pie, like that still tastes good to me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah. So, and, and you know, if you, if it is really hard, if you live in a family, I mean, you were on the road, your listeners, I don't know if a lot of your listeners are still on the road. It's really hard to keep that up when you're isolated, when you don't have people around you who are supporting you, or you live in a family of, of people who are eating differently than you do. And they come home with the freshly baked bread and you're like, Oh, so hard. I mean, it's, it's really hard. Um, it's really not easy. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons that like this community of people is so strong, uh, and that on some level, there's like such a feeling of camaraderie mm -hmm. that exists, uh, is that, I mean, we are, you know, it's really, it's a battle for it's a battle personally it's a battle politically it's you know it's a battle with your doctor it's a battle with your family i mean it is like it's just not easy yeah it's it's can be tough and you know people often go on to drugs because of stress because of trauma in their background because of that and i think food is the same way and if you if you look at what sugar, refined carbohydrates and sugar do, um, and, and the, the, sensor, the centers of the nervous system that they activate are the same centers that are activated by cocaine and heroin. Mm -hmm. and that endorphin response, that relaxation and, and to deal with that stress. And in many ways, the, the sugar and, and wheat refined grains have the same qualifications of a schedule one substance that are guideline in the guidelines yeah. as cocaine and things like that when you look at a schedule one it has no health or medical benefits and is only to get you high you know and there are things that are registered as a schedule one substance that actually have medical benefit probably shouldn't be registered as a schedule one substance, but you have this free drug sugar that you can get through Coca-Cola through, you know, whatever to make you temporarily happy. And we, we know what happens when the more people get stressed out, the more they go to that drug. Yeah. That's why I always say it. Yeah. I mean, I, I think just eating ahead of, 
you know, eat, eat, eating, eat, like, just eating ahead of that to the, not ahead of hunger, but eating the, ahead of that point where you're, or getting food ready ahead of the point where you're just going to go to the sugar, mm-hmm. right? You know, fill yourself up on good food um, as fast as you can so that you, it's, it's always at the time of weakness and real hunger that you just, you just want that quick fix. If you can get yourself filled up in healthy food first, you know, even if it's just like downing some whipped cream or something, <laughs> it's just <laughs> anything to protect yourself against going to that craving. Some people say like salt helps, you know, just a little bit of salt in your mouth helps. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, it's Apple just like that version. thing between you and the haagen Like, what are you going to put there? You have to put something really easy to grab and get to. So we touched a little bit on current events with this whole COVID thing. And uh, one of the things that I, I found very interesting coming out is that they're finding a lot of people on the keto diet uh, or on a more healthy, meat-rich, low-carbohydrate LCH diet are either not contracting COVID or be staying asymptomatic if they do contract COVID. And there's other factors like higher vitamin D um, and, and vitamin C uh, in the in this system as well. But do you think that maybe one of the blessings in disguise with this COVID thing is that if this research comes out that more people are going to stay asymptomatic, that maybe more people are going to start looking at the keto diet as a preventative measure? But, you know, I haven't seen the data on, on keto and it's whether it has uh, preventative effects or, or, I mean, I, I would love to see that data. I mean, it's, it's like beyond obvious that people with obesity, uh, diabetes, hypertension are, are, have, you know, two to three higher rates of the for risk of hospitalization, intubation and death. Um, mm-hmm. and I actually wrote an op-ed it, that turn, came out in the wall street journal. And I, and I said, how about a low carbohydrate? solution for um for covid like let's covid you know let's make ourselves less vulnerable to covid let's make our let's make ourselves into warriors against covid but um and i think that uh you know but that didn't get any pickup as an idea because number one people love the idea of getting healthier against covid but what they want is they take the top half of my op- my op-ed but then they I, they literally, somebody did this. They took the top half of my op-ed and rewrote it slightly. And then at the bottom, they said, so eat a vegan diet. <laughs> so you're kind of up against that, which is like, um, so that's the difficulty. Like they're happy with all the arguments on the top half. We need to be healthier and we need better nutrition. We all need to be stronger against COVID. But they, they then assign the solution as the vegan diet. Interestingly, the thing that is most tightly associated with poor outcomes from COVID is hyperglycemia. In other words, like having super high blood sugars at admission. What gives you super high blood sugars is carbohydrates. And so you know, a vegan diet is not going to fix that. Um, only a low carb diet can fix that. But um, I think the other, what also, works against, um, you know, people just don't believe in low carb. And, and and it's also that, you know, they want drug solutions. There's no money in low carb. You already mentioned this, but there's no money for it. There's no money for anybody really, mm-hmm. except for maybe, you know, I mean, some keto produced people who produce keto food, but the money's in the vaccine, the money's in the treatments, the money's in the drugs. I mean, the money is, the money is not in low carb foods. Right. And uh, it really is, you know, the, the, it really is the money that is driving this, these solutions. Um, I mean, I, I don't, I, I just think that um, it's, and, and the public health community really just doesn't want to believe, does, or has turned, it still has blinders on when it comes to low carb. Even if you, 
I've been at conferences where, um, you know, somebody presents the data on a, you know, on this experiment that reversed diabetes by 50%. Okay, no study has ever done that before. And not a single person in the audience even asked a question like, huh, what? Can you repeat mm -hmm. that? Your data, nobody even says like, oh, your data must be wrong or they're just like, don't hear it. Even mm -hmm. though there's not a single other diet that has ever reversed any diabetes. The diets that the that the, the government favors and that everybody tells us to eat, the you know, the the, the dogma, they can at best slow down diabetes uh, a little bit, but they but they they can they, they cannot reverse its progression. The only other thing that has been shown to reverse the progression of diabetes is an 800 calorie a day liquid diet for mm. life. So <laughs> who's signing up for that? <laughs> I mean, you should have the choice. It could, should be your choice. Every patient should have the choice. It's also true that bariatric surgery has been shown to reverse diabetes for a while. But you know, expensive complications. But 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 you know, everybody probably you agree with this, um, Dana. That you know, as a as a doctor, patients should have the choice, right? Right. It's true. Yeah, they should. But they should have. They should be able to make the choice based on solid, choice, solid proven options, right? They shouldn't be making a choice off of someone's opinion or someone else's ethics or someone, how someone else has been taught or swayed, you know, they, right. need, they need valid choices in order to make the choice. Right. So that's the problem. Yeah, but I mean, just think about like the choices for reversing diabetes. You can have 800 calories a day of mm -hmm. liquid formula. I mean, I think they do eventually reintroduce food, but, um, or bariatric surgery, or low, low carb. And some people, you know, they might choose bariatric surgery. Mm -hmm. Some people do, oh. but it's so easy to cheat it. Yeah. You know, that's the thing. You can, with bariatric surgery, you can, some people do really well, and some people figure out how to deliberately override the surgery yeah. later on. So. But I do I think know. this decision to get healthier in the face of COVID, as hard as it is, because it's a stressful time and it's perhaps the hardest time to get healthier, but, um, but it is a good decision to try to, like now is a good time to get healthier because yeah. your chances truly are worse if you go to the hospital obese. Much worse. So... Yeah, that I, I just interviewed a, a doctor named Quadwo Kyramente, and he's a, uh, he, he deals a lot with, with the COVID and putting people on ventilators and things like that. And one of the, re he started his own podcast and he's become a low carb uh, keto uh, uh, advocate because of the whole COVID thing because he's seen better outcomes with his patients who are going on low carb and ketogenic diets. So he's become a big fan and he's, he's, he's out there and he's not even really super ketogenic himself. He's very lean or, you know, so he, he has moderated his carbs, but he, he said that it is the people who are not taking care of themselves during this time who are going off the rails and eating more sugar and things like that, that are getting worse symptoms or contracting the, the disease much easier. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's interesting. I, 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 I would love to see more literature on that. I know there was an experiment, I believe it's at Johns Hopkins hospital where they were putting people on ketogenic diets upon entry to the hospital but um, you know, when I think about kind of the time it takes to convert your your metabolism, and I, I think it would be very hard to start the diet uh, right. 
you know, as you're also fighting COVID. So I'm not, I'm not so certain that experiment will, what kind of benefits they'll see. But um, yeah, now is the time, folks, especially as we see we're facing a second wave. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the good news is there's, you know, there's a lot of support groups. You, you, I'm sure you've talked about that on your show. There's, there's a lot of people who are encouraged and out there who can help people on their journey. Well, I, I do find that people are more successful on their their journey that involves any kind of willpower, whether it's a dietary journey or even if it's recovery from drug addiction or some other form of addiction with the buddy system. When there's other people around them and who are being supportive or, or have gone through the same experience. So I, I think as much as maligned as the social media platforms are, one of the good things that they do offer are certain groups and things like that where you can find like-minded individuals who are on, on the similar pathways and receive that support and, and help that you need to stay on path. Well, that's great advice. <laughs> also in coronavirus times, like you want to, you know, stay in touch with people. So that's another yeah. good, mm -hmm. it is really good advice. So, so, and if you like to read, read my book, because that is like, <laughs> it is like, it is, um, it does provide one thing. So if you like reading, I'm told it's a good read, but it's, it's also just that, there's so many questions that you have about like, is it really okay to eat meat? And is it really, isn't butter, it isn't, you know, isn't it, it's raising my LDL, what about that? I mean, there's so many questions that people have. And so having all the, having it all explained to you in one place, also just telling the story, like the story of how it happened, I think that helps people kind of understand uh, it helps them understand the big picture. It's for some people, they really need to see that big picture. Yeah, I, I do have a question on a personal level, just as far as the way your mind works. And because you said something at the beginning of the interview that kind of caught my attention. Right now, it seems like a lot of the keto uh, movement has been started by engineers, people in 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 Silicon Valley, who think about entire systems and entire ways things that work together. And then the doctors seem to be falling on board once they see results from other people. It seems to be the most common thing. And you said your dad was an engineer. Do you think you've come to this because of the fact that you, you developed the ability to think like an engineer and then brought that to your journalism and research where you're looking at entire systems? Yeah, that's kind of an interesting idea. I've never thought about that, but I, I do. I do think um, it requires somebody. Uh, I mean, it required. I think engineers have this quality, and I don't know why I have this quality too. But it's somebody who is willing to, uh, you know, question things. And what engineers do is like, if something's not working, they'll say they they'll take a you know, they, they'll, they'll figure out like, okay, we really need to look at this from top to bottom and question everything we're doing. It's like, you know, if the O-rings are exploding on the rocket ship, we need to really do a top to bottom um, analysis. And, you know, when I think about chronic disease in America, which is, um, which is like 6 million people a year dying from chronic disease, diet related diseases. And at one point I figured out how many 747s that was crashing every day. It was like almost 20 747s crashing every day and killing everybody on board. Um, and if you had that, like if that were a plane problem, uh, somebody would say, okay, ground all the planes and we need to figure out what the problem is. <laughs> And that's just, and they're willing to, they, they're, 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 like, what they produce has to work. Like, the bridge can't fall down. The plane has to fly. You know, it can't, you know, the rocket ship can't blow up in the sky. So they, their stuff has to work. They're held to standards and they're taught 
to have to question everything from top to bottom. I think that um, nutrition scientists, you know, they're just like, they grew up in this really hazy field. It's hard to do nutrition studies. And, you know, they look at, you know, like they look at the, the total failure of nutrition over the past 40 years, which is like, you know, 1980, the dietary guidelines start and obesity immediately ticks upwards and doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. And they look at that and they're like, well, people just must not be following the guidelines or it's not my fault or we can't prove anything or everything's very hazy, but they don't, they don't, they, they, they can't take the same rigorous approach. So I think maybe not engineers, but you definitely have to come from outside the field of nutrition science to be able to be truly critical of it. People inside the field um, learn a way of thinking that is so kind of imbibed in the basic mistakes of the field that it's very hard, I think, for them to make progress inside the mm -hmm. field. So <laughs> I don't know if that really answers your question, but it is, oh, it you know, it, it, it's people outside the field. Like, you know, Jeff Volick, you know, one of the most, probably the most important ketogenic researcher in the world he was he did not grow up in nutrition through a nutrition um background he was a i'm gonna get this wrong but anyway he studied exercise he's a kinesiologist or i mean anyway that's the wrong term but he people outside the field of nutrition have been the ones or journalists um have been the ones to do the more significant work in the field Hmm. Um, and again, it's also like, we don't depend on grants from the field. We don't depend on our getting our papers published in the nutrition journals. We don't, you know, we just don't depend on the field for our livelihood. Yeah. Right. I, I got to imagine there's some confirmation bias too, that some people can't get over, uh, when they're going in and doing their research as well. You would be right. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean... You know, we all have confirmation bias, don't we? You know, we all want to believe the choices that we've made in life are the right and good choices. But I mean, that's the deal. When you're a scientist, you're taught to have to distrust yourself. Yeah. That's what science is. But um, and in some fields of science, they can do it. And, and but a lot of fields of science have this problem where it's just like they they don't want to question their kind of their reigning hypotheses yeah mm -hmm. dana did you have anything you wanted to, to ask no me? well i did but i'm actually being called to go see a patient so i'm gonna have to jump okay. off, jump off here I'm okay sorry. i but for what it's worth i will be surprised by the end i the only other thing i wanted to know is um what your take on carnivore is oh. that's kind of a new or more extreme if you will yeah. Um, well, I know there's a survey being done um, on carnivores, uh, carnivorism. I mean, I, I probably know just about as much as you do. Is it, you know, people, I know there's a big booming movement. People seem to be recovering from all kinds of conditions that they couldn't solve otherwise. Uh, it's very clear that, you know, many people are allergic to uh, substances in plants. Um, because plant, as you know, I'm sure you've heard this, but plants can't run away when they're hunted. So they develop poisons in them in order right. to be eaten. And, and some people can't tolerate them. Like gluten is a well-known one, but there are many others in plants that can't be tolerated. So people are, many people are doing really well in carnivore, being a carnivore. Others, um, and this is just my own anecdotal experience, talking to people and seeing them on my Twitter feed. A lot of people try it don't do as well or don't like it as much, feel too restricted. Some people never want to eat anything but a ribeye ever again for the rest of their life. <laughs> Other people are like, no, I want, I, you know, I don't want to give up my vegetables. And so, I mean, I think it really, I think that um, many people come to it because nothing else works for them. Right. You know, I'm thinking of like Dr. Georgia Ede, mm -hmm. who, got there because she was selectively taking everything out of her diet and it was the only thing left that she could eat. Mm -hmm. um, and so, 
I think it's really a solution for people who, who don't have any other solutions. I mean, it's nice to eat a diverse diet if you can, yeah. mm-hmm. but some people really just cannot. But, mm-hmm. um, so I think, you know, I think we'll, we, there's a lot to learn about it. I mean, clearly there was an experiment that I recount in my book where, um, I'm sure you probably know this, but you know, the Arctic explorer who lived with the Eskimos, um, Stefansson, who came back to New York City and did the one year long experiment where he only ate meat and fat with his buddy. And they were supervised mm-hmm. by a team of medical experts and spent part of it inpatient in the hospital really to supervise them. And then at the end of that, they published six papers um, and could find nothing wrong with these right. two men. And that's probably the most rigorous experiment that's ever been done on carnivorism. And they, okay. you know, they didn't suffer from vitamin C deficiency because apparently you don't need as much vitamin C if you aren't eating carbs because carbs interfere with the absorption of, of vitamin C. So, um, and there's a tiny bit that's in, if you eat the whole animal, you have to eat the whole animal. You can get enough. Right. right that's all I know. Okay. That's it. <laughs> Go see your patient. Well, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I like I kept holding okay. you meeting you. Thank you so much for your time. All right. And and I nice can't to wait to, to hear what happens next when this All is right. released. <laughs> Bye. Right. Thank you, Dana. Thank you for Thanks. joining us today. Thanks. Bye, Yogi. Yeah, um, I'm going to go ahead and start ready getting to close out. If you have time, I do like to ask five quick questions for our, our members. Is that sure. okay? So, my first question What are three foods that uh, you believe everybody should avoid? Uh, vegetable oils, sugar, and um, and if you have metabolic disease of some kind, then excessive carbohydrates. Awesome. What are three foods you think everybody should include in their diet? Meat, if they feel comfortable eating it, uh, eggs and better. <laughs> Who are your top five health heroes? Wow. Um, okay. Gary Taubes, uh, or Taubes, I think is the correct pronunciation. Sarah, Dr. Sarah Hallberg, who's the leader of that experiment I was telling you about. Um, uh, health heroes. Um, I don't know. I have to think about that some more. Uh, Mark Kukazella, who is the West Virginia professor who was the first person in America to get rid of sugar at his hospital where he works. And is wow. just like one of the nicest people on the planet and is a super duper runner. Has written a book on running. Um, Tim Noakes in South Africa, um, who went to trial to defend his advice to give a low carb diet to infants um, over Twitter was where he gave his advice. And the last person I'm going to say is Zoe Harcombe, who is a phenomenal researcher in, she lives in Wales and she publishes a uh, weekly newsletter that is about recent science and, and it is, I think, greatest go-to place for learning about the, the most recent st- scientific studies if you're interested in that. She's really super yeah. smart, funny, a great. I'm subscribed to her newsletter and I, I'm hoping to get her on the show one day. Well, she's great. So, yeah. So, yeah. Actually, the Tim Noakes, Zoe Harkom, I'm, I'm hoping to get them all on. So, <laughs> well. but uh my my other question is, what is a health myth you wish you could do over, just get rid of overnight? Oh, that that to fear fat, that fat is bad for health. And what is something that you wish you could change about the medical industry overnight? Oh, that they knew anything about nutrition. <laughs> and that That's they awesome. prescribe nutrition first instead of pills. There you go. All right, everybody, this has been the Fatty Joe Show. Before I leave, I want to give 
One, I want to extend an invitation for you. If you ever have an announcement or anything you want to talk about, definitely just let me know. You are always welcome to come on the show. Thank you. So this is an open door. You could use this platform if you want. And then the other is I want people to know where to find co the Nutrition Coalition, how to, how to find you and the work that you're putting out. Well, thank you for having me on your show. It's been a pleasure. Um, you're great to talk to. You. And um, Nutrition Coalition is nutritioncoalition.us. Uh, and please go there. And again, please take action. My own website, which is, uh, is not so well um, updated, but has a ton of information on me, is ninateichels.com. And Teichels is spelled T-E-I-C-H-O-L-Z. Um, but you can also find me at the Nutrition Coalition um, and figure out how to spell it from there. So yeah, and, and on Twitter, uh, which is the main platform that I use is I'm at Big Fat Surprise. Awesome. And this has been the Fatty Joe Show, everybody. I want to thank everybody for listening and tuning in. If you want to support what we're doing and help us get more information and free content out to people, you can go over to patreon.com slash the Fatty Joe Show or patreon.com slash Carrie Brown, and you can support the show. We have the Patreons really keep the light on, lights on in here. We want to try to make this a, a uh, advertiser free platform as long as possible. So that helps. And I would just want to make sure everybody be is, not, is nice to everybody. Um, everybody's in tough times right now. So, you know, try to be extra nice when you're out on the uh, internet airways. <laughs> Have a great one. I second that. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you for joining us on the Fatty Joe Show. Be sure to leave a comment and subscribe. It helps the show reach more people. To support the show, as well as Carrie Brown and Yogi's work on the blog, Keto Recipe Development, Master Classes, and to gain access to private Facebook groups and other awards, go to patreon.com slash Show or patreon.com slash Brown. Also, check out our Carrie Brown and Yogi Parker YouTube channel for video versions of the Fatty Joe Show, recipe videos, and more. Join our awesome community on the Facebook group, The Keto Kitchen with Carrie Brown and Yogi Parker. And check out our CarrieBrown.com website for recipes, blog posts, discounts, cookbooks, masterclasses, and other great stuff. Thank you so much.